So this is ancient light. As you can see from the subtitle, it's talking about imaging a quasar without a telescope. Let me just remind myself that we need a click before we can operate PowerPoint. Okay, so we all know that the universe is vast and the universe is ancient. And we know that large telescopes have imaged galaxies that are billions of light years distant. One of those telescopes indeed was George's in his back garden observatory. And a couple of months ago, George posted uh, an image of a quasar because he was interested in answering the question that uh, he occasionally got posed, how far can your telescope see? So he tried to figure out whether or not he could image a very distant quasar. And after he posted this uh, a couple of months ago on the, on the BASOC forum, that got me thinking, if you can image a quasar, a very distant galaxy, billions of light years away with a telescope, is it possible to capture an image of one of these very remote objects without using a telescope? And as you can probably tell from the fact that I'm giving this talk, spoiler alert, uh, yes, it is possible to actually capture an image of a quasar at a very great distance, even without a telescope. So it started with a, a survey, don't worry about reading this abstract, but professionals have surveyed lots of these so-called quasars. What is a quasar? Well, it's the nucleus of a galaxy. It's a, a supermassive black hole at the heart of a galaxy that is emitting enough light to be seen at a distance of many billions of light years. That's what a quasar is. And one of the quasars that was surveyed by this bunch of professionals was this one. Goes by the wonderful name of J161737 plus 595020. What a great name. The identity, the, the ID, if you like, of these quasars is simply their coordinates on the sky. That's the only way of making sure that you're looking at the right one. So this particular coordinate you can see has got a declination of plus, plus 59. Mm. That tells us it's in the Northern Hemisphere, so it should be visible from the United Kingdom. So this particular <laughs> quasar, uh, they have taken this spectrum. So this is the intensity of light vertically uh, as a function of the horizontal axis, which is the uh, wavelength in angstroms. One angstrom is one tenth of a nanometer. So you can see the blue end of the spectrum is on the left and the red end of the spectrum is on the right. And one of the principal features here is this one at 6500 angstroms. And we know that if we were to look at a, a source in the laboratory, a source that is not moving relative to us, this particular line in the spectrum, this bump in the spectrum wouldn't occur at 6500 angstroms, it would occur at 1200. In other words, this particular spectrum has been redshifted. We can see from this peak that the whole spectrum has been redshifted and this particular peak has moved from where it ought to be at 1200, way over onto the left-hand side of the spectrum. It's been shifted from the ultraviolet way into the red, the 6500 angstrom point. So you can see from these numbers that the wavelength has changed by an enormous 5300 angstroms. Relative to its starting point of 1200, that's how we define the redshift. That's how we quantify how much the spectrum has been shifted. We look at a particular line and we look at how much is shifted compared to its original value. So in this case, that would be 5300 divided by 1200. That gives us a redshift of 4.3. They've calculated it a little more accurately here and they reckon that the redshift, which is usually indicated by the lowercase z, the redshift is 4.315, they say. That is enormous. The redshift is not just a few percent movement of the line in the spectrum, it's an enormous shift. The shift is four times larger than the wavelength itself. And a redshift of 4.3 works out that this quasar is very remote and indeed traveling, uh, at least moving away from us, uh, very quickly. I'll talk about the actual numbers in just a few slides time. All we need to know at the moment is that this is one of the remotest quasars and it's visible from the UK, which we can tell from its coordinates. So let's have a look at whether or not we can use a camera to find it. So I took my trusty Nikon, put a 300 millimeter lens. Remember when we're talking about photography, the 300 millimeters doesn't refer to the diameter, it refers to the focal length. So this is a lens um, 
of approximately 150 millimeters in length. Its focal length is 300 millimeters. Uh, and you can see a picture of it there. The camera and lens are mounted on a sky tracker, an iOptron sky tracker. This is a commercial star tracker, and a tracker is simply something that is designed to rotate the camera at one revolution per day, one revolution every sidereal day. And to make sure it's lined up correctly with the Earth, there's a polar scope here to make sure that the tracker is lined up with the Earth's axis. The camera is mounted on a very small little alt as mount here onto the tracker. That makes it easier to point the camera at any particular part of the sky whilst the sky tracker is doing its business of rotating the camera slowly around. So that was the, uh, the configuration I used. I then pointed it at a particular chunk of sky. Bear in mind that this camera is not a special camera, it's not a modified camera, it's not a, an astro camera. It is simply a camera lens that I would have used anyway, and indeed did use last year, on Safari for instance. So this same camera and lens have been used to photograph zebras, so the question is, can they be used to photograph a quasar? Here's where the quasar is. Remember the quasar ID number is also its coordinate, so I knew where in the sky to look. So I pointed the camera in the constellation of Draco. So here's Draco, here's Ursa Minor, there's Polaris on the right hand side of this little finder chart. And here we see the field of view of a 300 millimeter lens. As it happens, the quasar sits very close to a fifth magnitude star, which I've put in the middle of this field of view. I could see the star through my camera viewfinder, and hence when I knew that I was looking at that particular star, I knew the quasar was fairly close by. So let's have a look at the actual exposure. I exposed for something like two hours. Not in one long exposure, I took a whole series of short exposures. Uh, I took a series of hundreds of exposures, each of which were 30 seconds long. This was in the middle of July, just a few weeks after the summer solstice, so the nights weren't very long. I only had about two or three hours of something close to darkness to capture this image, and I just set the camera going, continuously taking images. Some of them were spoiled by passing clouds, so I had to throw um, a few dozen images away, and I was left with something like 250 good images. By the time I had thrown away the clouds, and thrown away one or two images that had very bright satellites going by. No aircraft, there don't seem to be enough aircraft to cause a problem these days. Um, so I was left with about 250 images of 30 seconds exposure each, so that totals a little over two hours of exposure. There in the middle we can see that fifth magnitude star, that's the one that I used to frame to make sure I was pointing roughly in the right direction for the quasar. Just a little bit further over is a, a somewhat fainter star, the one where the cursor is currently pointing. That star is eighth magnitude and that's the one I used looking through the camera's viewfinder or rather looking at the LCD screen on the back of the camera. That's the one that I used to make sure that the image was in focus, an eighth magnitude star. So that's the picture itself. Okay. The quasar is just next door to the, uh, to the bright fifth magnitude star that we can see in the center. So if we take that little rectangle there and blow that up, let's zoom in so we can see what's going on. Now we can see a number of faint stars and a few galaxies as well. And our friendly little quasar is that one there, the one in the center of this particular crop. It's an 18th magnitude quasar and this is proof that you can indeed capture a quasar using a camera and telephoto lens without any other optical equipment. So here, most of the light from the quasar is focused into about one pixel in the image. If we blow the quasar up still further, we can see that the, uh, the center of the quasar there, essentially most of the light has gone into that one pixel. I've made some of the fainter pixels just a little bit brighter to make it easier to see. But out of the 20 million pixels, the 20 megapixels of the whole camera image, the quasar is really only that one pixel and maybe just a, a couple of its neighbors as well. Whilst looking at this image and having a little exchange with George, 
I realized that what I was looking at here was not simply a few stars, but by comparing with George's image of the same quasar taken through his telescope and looking through the NASA archives of this particular patch of sky, I came to the conclusion that this eight arc minute by eight arc minute crop of the center of the image contains 10 galaxies. I don't expect you to recognize those as galaxies. Some of them are clearly galaxies because they're not round enough to be stars, and some of them are quite faint, but I've identified them as galaxies simply by comparing with professional images. So if this very small crop of the whole image contains 10 galaxies plus the quasar itself, then I reckon that the full image uh, will have captured something like 7,000 galaxies. So I'm not sure how many stars there would be in the full image, but the image is seven, probably contains 7,000 galaxies. I note that simply because, as you can see for the title of this slide, which I'm calling the Barrett Deep Field, um, if you think about the Hubble Deep Field, which took an exposure of one million seconds, or about 10 days or so to get the Hubble Deep Field, the number of galaxies caught in the Hubble Deep Field is about the same. It's, it's of order somewhere between five and 10,000 galaxies. Let's have a look or let's have a think about some of the numbers involved in capturing this particular galaxy or this particular quasar. How did the light come to end up at that particular pixel in the camera sensor? This is a plot of distance versus redshift, or you can see redshift across the horizontal axis and distance in millions of light years on the vertical axis. One thing we have to bear in mind whenever we're talking about very remote objects, very remote galaxies and quasars, not our neighbor in the Milky Way like Andromeda, but much, much further afield, it's sometimes sobering to remind ourselves that we can't actually measure distance in the sense that we can't tell how far a galaxy is away from us. We can't tell how far the light has traveled. We can't tell how long the light has been traveling. The only thing that can be measured for very remote objects is the redshift. If we can get the spectrum, if professionals or some indeed some amateurs can get a spectrum of a distant object by looking at where the peaks are or where the absorption lines are, then you can measure a redshift. That's essentially all you can measure. So everything else, like getting the time that the light has been traveling from that object to us, or the distance from that object to us, those are par parameters that can be calculated, not measured. So we can measure the horizontal axis, the redshift, and then we can calculate the distances and the times. That depends on how we think the universe has been expanding. That's the problem because the universe is not static. The universe started as a Big Bang and has been expanding ever since. As long as we understand how that expansion has taken place, then by measuring the redshift, we can determine distances. So for instance, we can tell how long the light has traveled from the object to us. That's the green line. And we can tell how far away was the object when the light first left that particular object on its journey to us. That's the blue line. And how far is it from us to the object now that the light has reached us? That's the red line. So you can see that there are at least three different ways of measuring distance, depending on how you define distance. Is it the distance it was when the light left? Is it the distance now? Or is it the distance that light has traveled? All three are different. If we were looking at the Hubble Deep Field, we would be looking at objects with a redshift all the way down to about six. But of course, in this particular case, we are looking at our favorite quasar, which is at a redshift of 4.315, which is roughly where that vertical line is. And if we read off the scales for this particular quasar, we find that we get those three numbers. So let me just remind you what those three numbers actually mean. The first number at the bottom, that tells us that the quasar, the distance from us to the quasar, was about a little less than five billion light years when the light was emitted, which was a long time ago, of course. It's not a very large distance because the universe was a lot smaller in those days. We are going so far back in time that the universe was substantially smaller in terms of the distance between any two galaxies that you choose, the distance was much smaller than the same distance today. 
So the quasar was originally a little less than 5 billion light years away when the light was emitted. And the light has been traveling for over 12 billion years. And to put that in perspective, that's about 90% of the age of the universe. The universe is about 13.8 billion years old, and this light has been traveling for about 90% of that time. Another way to think of it, the universe was only 10% of its current age when the light left to make the image that I've just shown you. Again, if we were dealing with the Hubble deep field, then we would be talking about a Z, a redshift, not of four and a bit. We would be talking about a redshift of six to maybe six and a half. And although this image shows that we can look back 12 and a half billion years, if we're looking at the Hubble deep field, that would be looking back 13 and a half billion years. So my camera can go back 12 and a half billion, Hubble can go back 13 and a half billion. That extra billion year look back is very expensive when you compare a Nikon lens to the Hubble Space Telescope. So the light has been traveling for over 12 billion years, 90% of the age of the universe. During that time, the quasar is no longer 5 billion light years away because the quasar has moved because of the expanding space. And during those 12 billion years, the universe continued to expand. And the, so the quasar is now roughly 25 billion light years away. So that's what those three numbers mean, the blue, the green, and the red. Before we move on, let's just note that the quasar used to be 5 billion light years away, and it's now 25 billion light years away. So it used to be 5, and it's now 25, which means the quasar has increased its distance by about 20 billion light years. And it's done that over a time period of about 12 billion years. 20 is bigger than 12, which means the recession velocity, the velocity at which that quasar is receding from us, that velocity is greater than the velocity of light because it's increased its distance by 20 billion light years in a time period of 12. So it's going at something like twice the speed of light. If we actually look at the light's journey, there's the quasar in the, uh, in the bottom left there. This graph is showing us distance from us on a scale of 0 to 12. GLY is giga light years or billions of light years to avoid too many billions. And this is time since the Big Bang. So the <coughs> zero in the bottom left hand corner is the Big Bang. And up in the top left, there's us here and now. So on the left is, is here because the distance from us is zero, and we can see that we're at 13.8 billion years since the Big Bang. So the light has basically gone from the quasar to us, but notice that the distance that the light is from us actually increases for a little while. Although the light is trying to make its way to us, it's actually going backwards for a substantial amount of time for something like 2 billion years, the light is going backwards because of the expansion of space. So the quasar, I've just said, is receding from us at something like twice the speed of light. And not only is the quasar getting carried along by that expansion, the light is as well. The light is trying to get to us, but it's moving through space and space is expanding to the point where the light is getting dragged backwards. That happens for something like two to two and a half billion years. The light is starting to make some headway, but basically is still going backwards until it gets to about this point here. And then the light starts to get closer and closer and closer to us and eventually reaches us some 12 and a half billion years after it left, 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. This idea of light moving through space, which is effectively expanding faster than light, is a very bizarre concept. It's like swimming through water at a speed where the water is flowing faster than you can swim. So although you're trying to swim forward, the water is actually carrying you backwards. 
It's like swimming into a, a head current or a head wind if you were flying, such that you actually end up going backwards. The concept that this happens for light rather than just for swimmers or rowboats in the water is, is quite incredible to think about light being dragged backwards. But that's what's happening in this particular situation. If we think about what the quasar is doing rather than what the light is doing, the green line is what the light does once it leaves the quasar, indicated in blue, and eventually makes its way to us 12 billion years later. What's the quasar during those, doing during those 12 billion years? Well, the quasar is getting further and further away from us. It ends up, remember, something like 25 billion light years from us, way over on the right-hand side of the screen by the time we get to now. So the distance to the quasar has been increasing greatly over that time. Strictly speaking, it shouldn't be a straight line. Treat this as rather schematic. The actual speed at which the quasar moves, or rather the rate at which the distance is increasing to the quasar, that speed actually changes a little bit. Although roughly speaking, the quasar is receding from us at twice the speed of light, sometimes it's a little bit more, sometimes it's a little bit less. On average, it's about uh, a little bit less than twice the speed of light, such that it can end up 25 billion year light years away from us after the light has taken its 12 billion year journey. So it's pretty amazing to think what the quasar has been doing and how large the universe is and what that light has been doing. And if we think of the light's journey from a more prosaic point of view, let's just think about the narrative of this ancient light. The light was emitted by the quasar 1.4 billion years after the Big Bang. So that's the 12.4 billion years ago. It's sobering to think that for more than half of its journey, the Earth and the Sun didn't even exist. It was only after the light had been traveling for some 8 billion years, only at that point were the sun, the solar system and the earth actually born. Life evolved on earth, the light traveled on. Dinosaurs came and went, the light traveled on. In the last million years or so of its journey, it finally arrived at the edge of our Milky Way galaxy. It crossed a few spiral arms, and entered our solar system. In the last few hours of its journey, it finally arrived at Earth, traveled through the atmosphere in a tiny fraction of a second, hurtled towards England, dodged a few clouds, entered the lens and hit the camera sensor, and that produced the pixel that we were looking at a few moments ago. Just a pixel in the image, but what a journey. So here's a visual summary of what I've been saying. The main image is the full image of the Barrett Deep Field with the fifth magnitude star in the center. In the bottom left, we've got the camera on the tracker that I used. The top left shows you where I pointed the camera in the constellation of Draco. And the inset in the top right there, indicated by the two lines, shows you where the quasar is. Again, just pointing out just a pixel or so but the light that produced that pixel had an amazing journey. And the camera was capable of producing what I like to think of the quasar's ancient light. Thank you all very much. <laughs>